Good morning, Moms of Master Books. Do you have a student who struggles with perfectionism, or maybe you struggle with perfectionism? Today, we're going to talk a little bit about that um, on our teaching tips. Hey, today I'm joined with my daughter, Brittany. Uh, she is also the publicist here at New Leaf Publishing Group, and so uh, it was easy to get her to come from the office next door into this office and talk. Uh, but we also have a little bit of a different perspective in that um, how we're going to do the format. So when we have the business, uh, when my last publicist left, we did a exit interview and kind of just debriefed a little bit on her time working here and, and the way that um, things that she thought we could improve and, and things that she thought were a home run. So we're going to do it almost like an exit interview because Brittany has left our homeschool and she's in the process of becoming more independent as a, as a young woman. And her and I <laughs> have, have also both been very interested in life coaching in the last, um, probably the last year. And so uh, we're always analyzing what's in our heads and what's in each other's heads. And so this is just a good opportunity <laughs> to try to, to mess with Brittany's head. <laughs> Sounds good. So, hey, be sure to comment for a chance to have 2,500 reward points added to your account. Um, that's something that we love uh, celebrating reward points with you. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about perfectionism. This is something that's very interesting to Britt. Mm -hmm. She, of all of our kids, we have nine kids, of all the kids, she is not the middle child, but she's once removed from the middle. She has two older brothers. How much older was Brandon? Brandon's two and a half years. Okay, two and a half years older. So she was like right at the tail end of two very um, tough on her brothers who probably contributed a lot to her being a perfectionist because if they could find any flaw or something to torment her with, they absolutely did and took great joy in doing that. And you always kind of felt the need to prove yourself to them. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about perfectionism, how would you define perfectionism in your life? Uh, well, okay. So it's, when I'm looking to do something perfect, I will rehearse and practice and practice, practice in my head over and over and over what I'm going to do. I um, prepare for anything that might go against what I'm trying to do. And then when I'm actually doing the thing that I've practiced so hard for, I'm super anxiety filled. And then um, I never feel like I actually hit that goal of perfection that I'm trying to get to. I'm a, like, uh, would you say perfectionism is a, um, an act or is it a feeling? Oh, definitely a feeling. Okay. I'm trying to achieve other people's approval, even though like, I don't know that I'm doing it at the time. Like when I step away from the circumstance, then mm -hmm. I can realize that, oh, I didn't really do that because I really, um, was taking joy in the journey and the process of getting somewhere. I was doing it more because uh, I was trying to prove something to somebody. Okay. So perfectionism, um, part of this is as a parent, also understanding that um, in order to have healthy kids, I have to be healthy, right? I have to be the one who leads health in my family. And I think we train our children um, to unhealth mm -hmm. as well. And so in this area, uh, what would you say, do you remember a defining moment in your relationship with, with us? What was a defining moment where you could feel that? You had mentioned handwriting at one point. Yeah, when I was really little, I was so I, it would have been probably about when I was six is when I realized that if I took extra time and did really good in my handwriting, I would get attention for that. And so that's something that I really stressed about and tried to work hard towards that and getting like A's on tests was something that I always tried really hard to keep up with. Yeah. So in our family, when you have, when you have um, three above you and then some below you, right? By the time you were learning to write with your hands, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to writing with your feet. Um, 
right. as you were learning handwriting. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that was like a place where you could actually stand out and get right. affirmation, get attention. You could be better than your brothers because they put nothing into handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, I know Nate's watching, so. Hi, Nate. <laughs> Nate's handwriting is, is as bad as mine. Um, but what's interesting about handwriting is for me, I remember very specifically sitting at a kindergarten table, like the memory is so vivid, sitting at the table with other kids and seeing people who had this beautiful handwriting. And I was left-handed, so I, I wrote across the page. I smeared everything. It was just a really big struggle watching these kids who had perfect handwriting and the teacher would be like, oh, your handwriting is so nice. And they'd look at me and there would be disappointment. And they didn't even really voice it and say, you are so stupid because your handwriting is bad, but I felt it. And, and there was a place right there at that spot where I decided for the rest of my academic career, I'm not going to ever gain your approval here. I can't, I can't compete at that level. Mm -hmm. So I, I checked out in kindergarten and it was really, for me, a lot of that goes back to that handwriting where it was just, um, it, there's no point in even trying because I'm comparing myself to these other people. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism is defined um, by psychology today as a trait that makes life an endless report card on accomplishments or looks a fast and enduring track to unhappiness. And I'm going to read that again because I think it's it really is good. Um, it's a trait that makes life an endless report card on accomplishments or looks. Do you feel that? Or have you felt that? Definitely. What makes perfectionism so toxic is that while those in its grip desire success, they are most focused on avoiding failure. And so theirs is a negative orientation. And love isn't a refuge. In fact, it feels too conditional on performance. And perfection, of course, is an abstraction. It's an impossibility in reality, and it often leads to procrastination. There's a difference between striving for excellence and demanding perfection. The need for perfection is usually transmitted in small ways from parents to children. Some is silent as a raised eyebrow over B rather than A, which you all the time so when our kids get to a certain level, we begin giving them chores. And, and it's not uncommon to get chores fairly early in life. Well, about the time you learn to drive, my motivation in teaching to drive, which is where all the gray has come from. You're welcome. <laughs> is, is as soon as they get their keys, they begin grocery shopping for the family. And so Brittany, um, she's, she's also very frugal in making sure that that we balance everything well. And so we'd give her the keys in a shopping list. When she'd come home with all the groceries, she'd give me the look of, here's the receipt, and then you say, I have a receipt look. Yeah, we, I dread the receipt look because I'd like budget things out, I'd make my grocery list, I'd come home, and then I'd give him the receipt. And if it was over what I had intended, I'd like watch his face real close. And like if he twitched his eyebrow or something, I'd be like, ah, the receipt look. And I'd take it as a personal attack and feel like really defeated because I put all this time, effort, and energy into doing this, and he was disappointed in it. So our brains are trained for pattern recognition, which means I don't, it doesn't really matter that, that, that she's a, an adult woman who's, who's gone and picked up groceries for the family and it costs what it cost and she filled out a list. Her brain recognizes that look as a look of disappointment that could have happened when she was four or three years old. Um, Brittany's, our relationship is unique in that the year when she was a baby, I traveled a lot and I was home. I was away from home a lot and probably separation anxiety. You definitely had that with, with me. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my reactions to things tend to have a big impact on you. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm, I think when, when we're younger, as a parent, it's harder because you have a lot more coming at you and the stresses of life as you get a little bit older and things kind of spread out a little bit and you can reflect on some experiences, it's a little bit easier. So um, parenting, I think, gets easier as you get older. So we're kind of 
as we as we talk about this, we're also providing a little bit of just some insight to parents who maybe you're in the middle of it all too. And, and there's a lot of stress going on. And I don't think that there's a way to prevent it all. Um, part of what we want to talk about with owning emotions is teaching our kids that so there are times I'm going to be disappointed. That's my emotion. Give me space to have my emotion. That's part of being human, right? right. And and I can't I can't always make the home peaceful. I can't always make people happy with me. That's not my job. Mm-hmm. And what have you learned in that process? Um, that yeah. So to give him space for his emotions, but to also like he can he needs to own his emotions, and I need to own my emotions. Um, just because he may give a weird look or something, that shouldn't be a personal attack on me. Like I just need to give him space and room, and that plays out in um, all relationships really moving forward. Because um, if I'm constantly looking for that, um, like I hand him the receipt, and he's like, "Oh, good job! Like you did awesome!" Like I'm not gonna get that. All of life is. Um, dealing with other people's emotions every interaction we have is dealing with somebody's emotions and how they react and stuff so just understanding that um everyone else has their own emotions and they need room to figure out their own emotions and i also Mm -hmm. have mine and so i can control my emotions and so maybe if you're legitimately disappointed i still need to work to control my emotions i can take your emotions into account Mm -hmm. but i need to work to control my emotions okay so how is there's times like more more since we've become more aware of kind of the coaching models Mm -hmm. but to be able to say um i have unhealthy expectations or i had certain expectations i just need to work through that you don't need to carry the weight of my emotion here give me space to kind of grieve that or deal with that and then, and you deal with the fact, if you have to deal with the fact that I'm not healthy in that expectation, right. you deal with it too. But mm-hmm. kind of having that conversation with our kids that when people are disappointed with us, I mean, there's, there's a difference here between striving to do something well, taking pride in what you do, and then a compulsion or a fear base of letting people down. And that's where the perfection side, where kids will shut down or kids will will become unhealthy and almost toxic in perfectionism. I mean, with Brittany, she didn't get to experience everything academically because she would take so much time, like answer keys for her would, were her nemesis, mm-hmm. right? And even like uh, Stoba, where it's more open-ended, answers may vary, just about drove her up the wall because tell me what the answer is so I can get the answer right, achieve what you want and not have any risk in this. Right. Yeah. What stuck out from what you said was um, I would carry, I carry the burdens of other people's emotions. It's so draining because I don't have time for my own emotions, but like if he gave me a look or something, then I'm, uh, I'm immediately thinking, well, what if I had done things this way? Why is he feeling this certain way? It's, and that affects like my relationship with my little sister is when we get into an argument, she likes to have a little bit of space and I'm mm-hmm. immediately like, um, no, we need to talk about this. Like, let's sit down and figure this out. Like, why did you feel that way? Like, you know, right. As opposed to just giving her a little bit of space and then working things through, not me trying to attack her and like not attack, but, um, go after her and try and figure out why she's feeling this way. And like, right. Mm-hmm. Part of that health comes, I think, learning to, um, we have to focus first on being in, and I call it good brain. Good brain is when I'm thinking logically about things. Good brain is when I'm realizing that my expectations are proper. Bad brain is when I go to an emotional brain where I start to immediately feel negative in the pain, like there's rejection, there's insecurity, all these things happen and you can feel it in your brain almost begin. Your forehead will get hot, your face might get flush and you begin to feel pain kind of. It's not hurting pain, but it's like a, it's just, it's a tightness and a pressure that you carry. And generally that's a cortisol dump that your brain is doing. And, and the reason it does that is it, it's, there's, there's, it's a response to pain and it, it tells your body do something about this. So when I'm young and my need is to be loved and accepted and and provided for, and somebody says, why are you so stupid? What that 
all of a sudden, for the first time, my brain feels this disconnect from the adults in my life or from the social group, and it hurts, and it's painful. My body says, you need to do something. You either need to conform or you need to run away. And and the brain doesn't recognize when you're 20 or you're three, it's just looking for those places that say, ooh, that feels familiar. And sometimes as a 20 year old or as a 50 year old, you can feel the emotions and the weight of something that happened when you were two or three. And even though you're no longer two and you're no longer three and you're no longer at that mercy, mm -hmm. your brain says, ooh, this is a familiar pattern and I need to, I need to respond. Staying in healthy brain is realizing, okay, at 20 or at 50 years old, I, I, have, I have more choices now. Let me look at this. What responsibility do I play? And staying in a logical, healthy brain as opposed to an unhealthy brain. Why it's important in this environment, I think, is as we're training our children, we want them to be emotionally healthy. And in life, there are going to be conflicts. We are going to disappoint people. Perfection isn't achievable. Agreed? Agreed. And um, even with those you love, like I love what Psychology Today said in that love isn't a refuge because it's always a scorecard. Mm -hmm. and, and so we want to begin training our kids to be aware of, am I in a good brain spot or am I in a bad brain spot? Am I in my learning? Am I challenging myself or, or am I trying to achieve this report card? And the academic system is really hard because it does report cards anyways, right? Who's a student that gets praised in a school setting? It's going to be the student who's an A or B student. Right. F students get rejected. Now, a lot of that goes back to a um, the scientific management, the work process where we, we want good employees. We want people who can perform the tasks that are set before them when they're told to do it. We're not really creating individuals or thinkers. So um, when we've moved, I think a lot of this became exposed as we moved into a new environment where suddenly you had new inputs and new, um, uh, new people to try to mm -hmm. gain their approval, right. I guess. Um, what's that been like for you? Um, it has made everything, it's like magnified all of my emotions um, because they are all new people. I don't know most of the people. Like every new situation has been all new people. So there's been no comfort in having somebody that I know in that search situation. Um, it's just, yeah, it's definitely made it a lot harder. And also like the difficulties in adulting um, are different too. So everything has really been new processes and learning experiences. So one of the things that we've worked on and you've, you've done, we call it brain work, where um, you really just work on kind of learning to be healthy. So when you come off an experience, actually identifying, why did, I, why did I feel that way? And as an educator, I would encourage you to do the same. Why does your kid's successes or failures make you feel like a success or failure? Um, step back a little bit and analyze Yesterday, what did I do in my homeschool that helped my, my children um, step into the journey? And that's something I want to talk to you about. Um, so what have you learned? What is like one of the top takeaways that you've been learning about the struggle with perfectionism? It's okay to not have all the answers. Like I said at the beginning of the video, when I go, I'm just going to use drumming as an example. When I have to prepare for a worship set, I practice and practice. I'll put hours and hours in, like six hours for four songs or whatever, because I want to get it perfect. I'll get to practice. Um, everything that I've prepared for doesn't go the way that I planned for it to go. Um, and so then I'm super, super anxiety filled. Um, there's been so many times I've called you like, Dad, what have I gotten myself into? Like, why am I doing this? And you kind of just like, Brittany, it's okay that you don't know everything. Like, we're all human. Like, and you like work through things. And then I think, I'm her coach. I'm the call, the coach uh -huh. call. Um, <laughs> and so when I actually do this, when we actually do the set list and the worship list, at the end of it, I'm feeling so um, 
a relief that I got through it and it actually went well. I'm always surprised that it actually goes amazing. Um, but then every time I try and go back, like every time they say, hey, do you want to work on this set with us next week? Then I'm like, oh, I have to do that all again. And I dread the emotions of it versus um, if I actually take a step back, not maybe practice as hard mm -hmm. and I leave some room for situations that might happen. Um, I embrace the journey more than the destination. Right. Because we both have a trait where we would practice something for approval or for recognition or mm -hmm. to meet that need, okay. as opposed to doing it for a joy of learning. Right. And, and then we don't enjoy what we're doing. Right. I set my standards so high and I prepare for all the things that situations that might come against my plan and figure out how to take them. And then when something doesn't go the way that I plan for it to go, it's like horrible. And so, yeah, to uh, enjoy the journey more and embrace the mistakes versus that always reaching for this um, standard of success that I can never reach. Right. And so for a parent, I think embracing the journey is creating a culture that's safe. When you have teams, the way in a business, the most effective teams isn't actually talent. While talent is helpful, the most effective way to have healthy teams is safety. That each team member feels the safety to present their ideas and to make mistakes without everybody tearing them apart. Mm -hmm. Our biggest need as human beings is the need for love and connection. That's the way God wired us, to be connected to him and to be connected to each other. When I feel rejected by other people, that there is there's a major problem in my life one way or another and so i either have to find a way to deal with that healthy or or i begin to operate very unhealthy and a lot of unhealthy behaviors come from this very one need that we have as human beings mm -hmm. we want to as educators create a culture and an environment that is is healthy and safe and so i think that's where with masterbooks a lot of the focus that we have on the curriculum is we want to inspire thinking. We want to inspire conversations. Um, we don't want grades. And, you know, we have we have a challenge in that we have laws that we have to follow and we have to do testing. We have to keep our kids kind of on grade level. But as my kids advocate, I can I can be creative in making sure that my kids don't feel that pressure. Um, sometimes my my four-year-old doesn't have an interest in reading and they're still wanting to play and be creative and and the neighbor's four-year-old is already reading novels and and love shakespeare and so i feel the pressure to make my child perform at the level of this child now i don't look at the individual and i don't say but this child is unable to play or be creative and this, my child is developing that skill. I'm, I'm focused on comparison. Comparison is the death of happiness. But we have to create an environment where we, we especially early childhood development is so wide. You know, there, there are people who put so much pressure on their kids at such a young age. And I've been amazed in our own kids' lives to watch some kids that struggled and struggled and you know, I, I was I was a brutal taskmaster because I felt like it was a willpower issue more than a developmental issue. And then all of a sudden, they just one day it all just came together and clicked and off they went. And it's like, man, we wasted a lot of time um, on something that really wasn't there. So growth hacking is a concept that we came up with in marketing. There is a phone call. Growth hacking is a concept that um, marketing uses. And what happens is there's, there's a lot of different channels to use. And what we'll do is we'll apply a little bit of energy and money and resources in each of those areas. And I'm expecting when I growth hack, I expect failure. Mm -hmm. It's not, I'm not looking for perfection. Everybody knows that I'm going to apply $10 here, $10 here, $10 here, $10 here, and I'm going to lose $50 and I'm going to make 20 the first time. Next time, I'm going to, I'm not going to do the ones that I failed on and I'm going to apply more energy over to the areas where, um, that I had success in and then a couple of new areas. I'm going to fail another time, but now I have two wins. That's something you've applied that concept, um, 
a little bit to your own life. Talk about that. Right. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like you kind of discussed a little bit like the law of numbers, you put so much out, you're going to get some negative feedback. So for me, um, to understand that I there's no possible way I can I can please everybody. Um, a podcast that we listened to, she said, um, you can be the juiciest, greenest, um, most gorgeous green apple possible. Um, but some people love oranges, and they don't like apples. And that's okay. Like, it's just different tastes and different styles like so to know that i'm not going to please everybody so um it helps me to focus more on myself and the things that i want to learn versus mm -hmm. trying to um work to please other people so being a from a spiritual standpoint mm -hmm. how do we tie that in do you feel do you do you have a tie-in a tie-in, a spiritual tie-in. I'm on the spot. Um, yeah, I feel like. Hmm. Well, I can I can help a little bit. I did put you on the spot. I think we are the Lord created us all unique as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, that even even in His description of the body of Christ, there are many parts mm -hmm. and many skills that we have. And, and the problem we have with a cookie cutter type education is we're all trying to produce one type of body part. But actually, the gospel message of Jesus Christ is more liberating than that because it says, no, we're all individuals. We all bring something to the table. And okay. together, we actually do more than we do as individuals. And so the idea that I should just be like everybody else and I should comply with everybody else means that I'm actually... Um, hurting because I'm not bringing my individual gifts, talents, and strengths to the table. Yeah, that's really good. That is good. good. Tie -in. And so there is a gospel message. That's what's beautiful about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's liberating. It sets us free. It doesn't hold us in bondage. And so mm -hmm. to say that, you know, before we went live, Brittany was doing the escalator behind me. She was doing all kinds of stuff um, in her sense of humor, but, but is, is remarkable. Right. But a lot of times that fear of what people are going to think shuts yeah. you down. So you almost become withdrawn in a way. And yet when you bring out who you are, other people's lives are made better. Mm -hmm. So we want to teach our kids, not just because it's healthier emotionally, but because it's the way God designed us. Jesus. He didn't want everybody to look alike or act alike or behave alike. Mm -hmm. He wanted to give us individual, um, components so that when you put us all together we make this beautiful picture that we don't when we're by ourselves right embracing uniqueness yes so following the growth hacking model what you do is um, you test a lot of different things some kids are going to do really well with math if they don't do as well with math then give them the basic skills but then focus on what they do well with and reward that behavior if, if they can write and communicate let them communicate not every kid's going to be good at grammar and, and that's okay too. It hasn't held me back. <laughs> the, fact, the fact that I don't always know where to put a comma is, is not an inhibitor. Sometimes it's embarrassment, <laughs> but it's not an inhibitor. I'm just letting you know. All right, the fact that I can't spell hasn't hurt me that badly. Um, the fact that, that somebody, somebody took time to help me communicate big ideas and enjoyed the fact that I had big ideas, um, that has served me well in life. And, and, and my handwriting as a pastor, I would stand up and do a whiteboard, and I, my handwriting was pretty atrocious. Most people couldn't read it. I needed um, somebody with the gift of interpretation to, to help with my handwriting. But again, it doesn't really, it hasn't held me back. So give your kids a little slack in those areas mm -hmm. and deal with your emotions, right? So that you can be healthy in helping them deal with their emotions. Right. Okay. Um, I think we have to be our kids' safe place. I would, and, and we've talked about this, actually trying a new adventure every week where failure is a possibility. Um, one of my sons went and bought a jackfruit it was like $25 for this thing. <laughs> Took forever to cut it up, 
it was huge. a fail. It was like, oh, I can't it figure was, out which side huge. I'm on in the camera. It was like this big. Yeah. And it tasted like gummy bears. Gummy bears and dirty socks. I don't know. It was yeah. nasty. Yeah. Not that I know what dirty socks taste like. <laughs> I was so proud of him for doing it because it gave us a new experience. And while it wasn't a win, it was an experience. And we right. realized we probably won't spend $25 <laughs> again on jackfruit. But it was something that, that gave us... Um, it just expanded our horizons. And so with your students, do something that's a little bit, uh, uh, there's an adventure in it and the potential there to, to have, have something, a failure. We're not talking moral failures. We're talking about just, we didn't succeed. We tried a new food and it wasn't that good. Or maybe it was something delicious. Or we went to a new location and we, we walked around and just, is this something that we enjoyed, the culture and the environment and those type of things? Maybe we try painting right. or, or a new game and just try some things that have the potential of the risk for failure right. and then celebrate the fact that, hey, we learned a lot from this. This isn't, right. you know, um, you have a quote that you found this morning that kind of goes along. Confidence is your willingness to fail in front of other people in, in developing that in our students mm -hmm. that we um, are, we gain confidence when we're willing to take those risks right. and we can do that in a controlled and safe environment. Right. Do you have anything you'd like to add on the discussion? Just um, yeah. With, setting yourself up for saying, okay, this week or this month, we're going to put ourselves in three opportunities where we have the opportunity to fail and letting your child know that, um, like sharing that with them, making that a process that they are also working towards. Then it becomes more of a celebration versus the, uh, like a downer type thing where if you do fail, because then you're like, oh, hey, we tried this and it didn't work. But you know what? That's okay. Let's identify the things that didn't work so mm -hmm. that next time, like if we want to change the experience next time, we can take the things that didn't work and try and alter them. Celebrating it more. Yeah. yeah. Celebrating the mistakes. Right. Right. What would you say for a kid who's struggling, who um, maybe they've kind of shut down and how can a parent begin to help build that confidence again? Um, so one of the biggest things that you helped me with lately, um, I applied for a job on the weekends. So I'm still working here, but I applied for a job on the weekends and I went into it feeling like I needed to know everything. Um, again, knowing all the factors that might come against my path that I'm taking um, and preparing for that. But there's like, I can't, there's no possible way I can do that. So he said, um, if somebody asks you a question that you don't know, this seems so simple and basic, but if somebody asks you a question you don't know, you say, um, that's a great question. I don't know personally, or I don't have the answer, but I'm really happy to go and try and figure that answer out for you. And then we can um, work forward on that. So just knowing that it's okay to not have the answers. Um, it's okay if you're getting things wrong in your math book. I was horrid at math all the way through. But um, if you keep applying effort and attention to that and you're open to the possibility of um, reaching out and trying to learn, it's, it's distracting <laughs> when people put angry faces. Um, they don't. Facebook, Facebook does, does it? it? Well, that's annoying, Facebook. You should stop. It's distracting. <laughs> Um, just... That's why we started Frowny Face Free Friday, because the first time I started this, I'm like, what this thing? People are like frowny facing me, and I'm not saying anything controversial. Yeah, knock it yeah. off, Facebook. <laughs> um, yeah, but giving yourself the opportunity, like the ability to say, like, it's okay that I don't know the answer. It's not the end of the world. My life isn't going to end. If I don't pass this test, that's okay, but let's figure out why I didn't pass the test and put our energy towards that. Right. Cat tests for me were horrid. The, the California standard, what is it? California achievement tests? Yes. Because if I didn't know an answer, they're time tests. So if I didn't know the answer, I was going to like hang on that answer until I figured it out. And then I'd run out of time. Yes. And she took it against her brother one year and her brother actually blew off the test, but nobody knew that. So he was like done 20 minutes before everybody else. And of course, when the scores came in, we realized what had happened. But at the time, it put a lot of undue pressure on the rest of the kids. Right. I was like, wait a sec. If he's finished now and I'm, st I still have 
a third of the test left. Like, what am I doing wrong? And it played into that. Well, that like that was a perfectionistic thing that I needed to work on. Like I yeah. needed to become faster to get to my goal. Yeah. Well, I'm big on um, giving people a vocabulary to be able to express their emotions a little bit better or to express the concepts. It's something that um, we do here in the group where we see people have a certain feeling, but we want to express it. For instance, one of the a vocabulary that we have that, that we developed from what people are saying is it's not about doing more. It's about teaching your kids to think more that that helps explain master books and why we love it. Well, in this case, I think there are some things we can give to our kids. We can start using a vocabulary that helps them. Um, one is in this family or in this environment, there's room for growth. We don't expect perfection because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We have a group of almost 12,000 homeschool moms that exist here in Moms and Master Books. 11,500 of you can absolutely love what we do. There's guarantee, just because of the law of numbers, there are 10 moms right now in this group that don't like us and are not happy with Master Books or the way we talk or the way we dress or something. It's just gonna happen when you put people together. Mm -hmm. I have to know that there's room for growth. There's no perfection and that I also have to give people permission around me to not like me, to say, it's okay if I'm not your apple. You don't like apples. You like peaches. It's okay. Right. It's I okay. need to stop tying my identity into your emotions Yes. and just work to grow myself. Yeah. I'm an apple and I'm going to be the best apple I can be because there are people that like apples and there are going to be people that don't. And if you're a person who don't like apples, it's okay. <laughs> Right, I'm not being mean doing that. I'm giving you permission right. to not stay in a place where we're both unhealthy. Well, and to understand that not everybody will like you and it's okay. Exactly, so that kind of vocabulary helps us. Um, growth hacking, it's a mindset that says, today I'm gonna try some new things because mm -hmm. you know I just went out and I bought, um, I bought, for the boys and I, I bought an archery, some recurved bows and some different things. and. And it's something that we're going to try and test and we're going to expand ourselves a little bit mm -hmm. just to gain an experience. It may be a win. It may be a fail. And if it's a fail, it's okay. It's not the end of the world because we don't know if we don't try. Right. And so there's some other things that we can begin talking about. For homeschooling, somebody had posted they have a 12-year-old son. He's frustrated, wants to go back to school. Could I encourage you to change the culture a little bit? Um, step back, drop, drop, the, drop the, the stigma of homeschooling, and begin using different vocabulary with him that um, you're life schooling. The world is our classroom. Unfortunately, for people who go to a public school setting, their classroom is only this big. But when you're a homeschooler or a life schooler, it's this big. Right. Brittany got exposure to a lot of different things. A lot of she's been she's been part of children's ministry. She's played drums and gone to camps and and done a lot of different things with music. She's gotten to be a publicist at a publishing house. All of these different things because she's a life schooler. The world is her classroom. She never stops learning, never stops growing. And so for the student who thinks that he's missing out on a public school environment, that's a tiny little box that they put you in but we have so much more opportunity to learn. Then as an educator, step back and get out of the mindset that you need to copy what they're doing in that box. Mm -hmm. Begin to look at the world as a classroom. Let's do some things different, right? We don't need to be involved in every sports team that happens. We don't need to be involved in every church event that happens, but let's start looking at ways that we as a family can do new things. We've done some pretty fun things as a family, just looking to have new opportunities. In fact, it hasn't been as easy to do it here, but we've done, um, uh, we used to do like every Friday was field trip day and we would pick another place around and it was cheap. We mm -hmm. would just pick like, you know, a cliff somewhere, a waterfall or a dam somewhere and, and go and just explore that for a day right. and go grab cheap sandwiches. And, and that was some of the best memories I have of everybody just mm -hmm. being together as a family. So create that environment where the world is a classroom and we're learning. 
and learning is really controlled failure, right? It's just saying, um, if, like it was walking, none of us would be able to walk if we hadn't fallen. And that's how we learn to catch our balance. That paradigm should be how we approach life. Failure should not be a death sentence. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is we don't focus on the failures as much as we focus on where we're going. So um, in my past, if, if there are things that I focus on all the time in my past and I'm always trying not to be the person I was in my past, like I've always had bad handwriting and I'm trying not to have bad handwriting, I still have the identity of a bad handwriter versus I'm working to develop my skill to be a better handwriter. Um, I'm, I'm working towards being who people are that have good handwriting. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference in the mind that just switches from the negative to the positive. Right. So, all right. I think I've, I've said quite a bit. <laughs> I don't know why I laughed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. I've got a lot of comments. Hi, everyone. Well, I thank you for joining me today. Mm -hmm. Be sure to comment on this video. A little different this week. We don't have a Thursday teaching tip because um, Kristen and I are going to be attending the Teach Them Diligently show in Rogers, Arkansas. And if you're in that area, we certainly would love to um, connect with you. If you are a mom of Master Book, be sure to stop in and get a picture uh, that we can post in the group and let everybody know that we connected. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we didn't have a flash sale today. Josh is out sick. His whole family has strep throat. So he better not have brought it to the office. That's all yeah. I'm saying. So I'll pray for him and have compassion as long as we don't get it. Okay. <laughs> well, hey, guys, God bless you. God bless you in this journey. Um, we have this awesome privilege as home educators to train, disciple, winners and leaders and thinkers and it's so exciting to see your kids take off i know i said i was going but um jessica posted in the group about her son who didn't enjoy writing and then all of a sudden it clicked and he wrote like seven chapters that's the moment the brain says yes i get it right i'm not under compulsion i'm learning because i'm a life schooler and the world is my classroom and i'm i'm gonna rock this so that's what we want to see for each and every student represented in this group. All right. You can sign us up. Hi. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week. <laughs> God bless.